Welcome to another medical update from drppt.in. Today, we are diving deep into the new ADA ESD consensus guidelines, specifically their algorithm for telling type 1 from type 2 diabetes in adults. Now, we all know this can be a real clinical challenge, so having a clear, structured pathway is a game changer. Okay, let's kick things off with a number that should really grab your attention. 40%. That is the staggering percentage of adults with type 1 diabetes who are first misdiagnosed with type 2. Just think about that. It perfectly highlights why we so desperately need a better, more systematic approach. So here's our game plan. We're going to walk through the whole diagnostic process these new guidelines lay out. We'll start with the problem itself, then go step by step through the clinical algorithm and wrap up by connecting that diagnosis directly to management. All right, first up, the misclassification problem. And you know, it's so important to understand why getting this right is absolutely critical. This isn't just about semantics or getting the label correct. This is about avoiding diagnostic mistakes that can have immediate and sometimes very serious consequences for our patients. Yeah, because getting that diagnosis right, it literally sets the course for everything that follows. We're talking about the right insulin regimen, whether or not to use other therapies, and even the kind of psychosocial support the patient is going to need. If you get it wrong at the start, the whole treatment plan can go off the rails. Okay, so where does the algorithm start? Right at the beginning, with the clinical clues, what you see and hear when the patient is right in front of you. Now, these clues are powerful, but the guidelines really emphasize that in adults, those classic features can start to blur. It's all about building a complete picture, not just hanging your hat on one single thing. And here you can see those classic pictures side by side. On one hand, you have the features that scream type 1, younger age, lower BMI, that unintended weight loss, and of course, ketoacidosis. On the other hand, the more typical presentation for type 2. The real challenge, and the whole reason this algorithm exists, is that we're seeing more and more patients who have a mix of features from both columns. So what do you do when that clinical picture is, well, a bit murky? You move from clues to confirmation. And that brings us to step two, antibody investigation. This really is the modern cornerstone for diagnosing suspected adult onset type 1 diabetes. Now, the guidelines are pretty specific here. They recommend a cascade approach to really boost your diagnostic accuracy. You start with GAD antibodies. They're the most common in this group. But if GAD comes back negative, you don't stop there. You move on and test for IAA2 and or ZNT8. The stepwise method is designed to be as sensitive as possible and catch those cases you might otherwise miss. Interpreting these results is pretty straightforward, for the most part. If you have two or more positive autoantibodies, boom, that confirms a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. But, and this is a big but, a negative result does not rule it out. In fact, about 5 to 10% of adults with new onset type 1 are antibody negative. So a negative test just tells you one thing, you've got to dig deeper. And that's where step three comes in, C-peptide assessment. This is our go-to when antibodies are negative, but we're still highly suspicious of type 1. It's really our best tool for getting a direct look at how much of their own insulin a patient is still making. So, when exactly should you be measuring C-peptide? Simple. It's all about clearing up that diagnostic uncertainty. It gives you a direct physiological answer when the clinical picture and the antibody tests just don't add up. But listen, for this test to be worth anything, you have to get the conditions right. It's so, so important. You need to measure it with a glucose level, preferably when the patient hasn't been fasting. And critically, you've got to avoid testing right after a major hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic event because that can temporarily shut down beta cell function and give you a falsely low number. And once you get that result, these thresholds give you some really clear direction. A C-peptide below 200 pmol per liter, that confirms severe insulin deficiency. You're looking at type 1. If it's over 600, that points very strongly to type 2 and its characteristic insulin resistance. And that gray area in between 200 to 600, well, that's where you need to put it all together with the clinical picture and probably follow up. Okay, but we all know medicine isn't always textbook, right? Not every patient fits neatly into this box. So let's talk about decoding those atypical presentations, because these can be some of the toughest diagnostic puzzles we face. So let's chew on a common puzzle. Your patient shows up with DKA, the classic sign of absolute insulin deficiency, but their autoantibodies are all negative. What in the world is going on here? This is where you have to start thinking beyond that simple type 1 versus type 2 divide. 
Well, one major possibility you need to have on your radar is something called ketosis-prone type 2 diabetes, or KPT2D. These patients can look exactly like type 1 when they're admitted. The key difference is no autoantibodies, and this is crucial, they actually recover their C-peptide secretion once you get them through that metabolic crisis. Their beta cells were just severely stressed, not destroyed. And here's another big one to think about, especially in your younger antibody-negative folks, monogenic diabetes. This is caused by a single gene defect, and it's so often misdiagnosed as type 1 because it can show up in young, thin people who need insulin at the start. So, when should your alarm bells be going off for monogenic diabetes? Well, you're looking for a cluster of clues. The patient is antibody negative, but they still have pretty good C-peptide levels. There's a strong family history, maybe a parent with diabetes, and they were diagnosed pretty young, say before 35. If you see that combination, genetic testing is definitely something to consider. All right, let's bring this all together and talk about what this means at the bedside. Because an accurate diagnosis isn't just an academic exercise, right? It's the foundation for safe, effective care, and honestly, getting it right can change a patient's life. And this quote from the guidelines, wow, it really lays out the stakes in no uncertain terms. Mislabeling an adult with autoimmune diabetes as type 2 can directly lead to holding off on insulin or not giving enough, which can then trigger a life-threatening episode of DKA. The stakes just couldn't be any higher. So the key management principles here are crystal clear. Rule number one, if you even suspect type 1 in an adult, your default should be to offer insulin, even if you're waiting on tests. On the flip side, getting that monogenic diabetes diagnosis right is a massive win because many of those patients can actually come off insulin and get better control with just oral meds. And that really brings us to our final and maybe most important question for you. This algorithm isn't just for your brand new patients. It's a fantastic tool for reevaluation. So think about your own patients right now. Based on this, who might need a second look? Who's that type 2 patient who's just never quite been on track? And hey, if you'll want to take this framework and apply it in your own practice or teaching, we've got you covered. You can download a PowerPoint version of this entire presentation right from the library section of drppt.in. As always, thank you for joining us for this drppt.in medical update. We'll see you on the next one.